Okay, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Thank you, Krishnan for our last seminar. It was a very busy week. Frank, Frank is about to go and he's just managed to get this seminar in. Um, range characterization of the spherical random transform and unique continuation property. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And um, uh, so before I begin, uh, so this is based on joint work with two of my current students. Uh, Divyan Shagarwal and uh, Nisha Singhal, and uh, with High Combat Sumian of University of Texas at Arlington. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, range characterization of spherical radon transform. Well, that's you know that's that's very well known, uh, but I'm going to focus on a very specific uh, uh, subclass of functions, and uh, I'll get to that in a minute. And then um, uh, understand understand that in the context of unique continuation principle. So I can use this. Is there a way to? Uh, no, if I if I connect. Oh, uh, I see. Like there should be some USB stick or some. Yeah, here. Does work. Um, that's that's the point. Yeah. You want it to quick size, right? But it doesn't move, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. It's recognized. Oh, it does. Oh, right. Yeah. So, um, so I'd like to thank, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Isaac Newton Institute and uh, this for the semester program. And uh, especially, you know, so I think these are not all the organizers, but these are the organizers that I interacted with. On a more or less regular basis, uh, Bill, Sean, Francis, Romina, and Tanya, and uh, so and also this uh, Isaac Newton Institute for providing uh, such a stimulating research environment. So uh, most of the work was done here, and uh, finally, I'd like to thank Peter Kuchman, uh, uh, Leonid Kuniansky, and Todd Quinto for invaluable discussions regarding this problem. Okay. So uh, let's start with the classical radon transform uh, very quickly. Um, so if so, I for simplicity I'll assume f is in Schwartz, and so the radon transform. Uh, so that's going to be defined as integrals over hyperplanes. So the hyperplanes are going to be parameterized by omega comma p, and where omega is the unit vector which is perpendicular to the hyperplane, and p is the signed distance. So by signed distance we mean if p is positive then you go along omega. If P is negative, you go in the direction uh, minus omega. And uh, so if, if that is the case, then the radon transform is defined as the integral of F along this hyperplane, uh, where this dx is the, is the Euclidean measure on the hyperplane. And uh, uh, so the Euclidean measure is going to be given by, given by this over here. Um, so note that, uh, uh, if you have R, so, so if you consider the radon transform of omega comma P, that's the same as the radon transform of F in the direction minus omega and then minus P. So this is where the P being signed distance is important. And uh, so then if you apply, so, so if you define the, the, the Fourier transform of the radon transform to be the Fourier transform in the P variable, uh, so that is, it's a parameter dependent Fourier transform. So it's omega is fixed and then you just consider Fourier transform on P. So then up to a constant, so this is the Fourier slice theorem. So F hat of rho omega is RF hat of rho comma omega, where the Fourier transform is taken in the uh, P variable. Oh, sorry, I should have been omega comma rho, but. And uh, so actually, if you look at uh, Helgerson's book, um, uh, uh, you know, in the context of range characterization that I'm going to talk about. So uh, he essentially defines the Fourier transform. Uh, so uh, in order to define the range character, in order to get the function for which, you know, whose radon transform is actually uh, the function that you began with. Uh, so he actually defines this using this, uh, uh, using the Fourier slice theorem. And the whole point of the exercise uh, of the non-trivial uh, 
con uh, non-trivial theorem in the context of range characterization is to prove smoothness of f hat at the origin. Okay, so what is the range? So let's get to the range characterization. So the range characterization for radon transform uh, is as follows. So if so, so one condition is clear that RF of omega comma p is the same as RF of minus omega minus p. And if you look at if you look at this particular, uh, so if you start with f in Schwartz for simplicity, and then you consider the radon transform, then if you look at this p pk RF of omega comma p dp, uh, so uh, these are integrals over hyperplanes which are perpendicular to omega and then this this p is over minus infinity to infinity so this applying Fubini this transforms to an integral over rn and what you actually get is a homogeneous polynomial of degree k uh, in the angular variable omega so I forgot the homogeneous part and uh, in fact this is this is theorem due to Helgerson uh, probably others uh, so, so what it says is the following is that if you consider a Schwartz class function by Schwartz, we mean, so this SN minus one is a compact part. This R is a non-compact part. So you can think of this as parameter dependent. And in the R you have decay at infinity, roughly speaking, and all the polynomial times that also decays and all the derivatives of it. So, uh, if you consider that, so then the, the following two conditions are necessary and sufficient. So evenness. And this this particular property that I, that we mentioned over here. So one thing to notice is the following. So that is this p p k g of omega comma p. That is, if you start with any Schwarz class function g in s n minus one cross r, and then if you have this uh, this particular property as well as this particular property, then you can always produce a function f which is in Schwarz such that r f is equal to g and uh, as I mentioned before, the main point of this particular, so these are the moment, moment conditions. So the main point of this is to show smoothness of F hat at the origin. Okay, so in particular, notice that if you start with a function, let's say G tilde, which is uh, C infinity and is even, and of course in Schwartz class, then uh, both these conditions are satisfied. So if you have this, uh, then what you get is that uh, this particular function g tilde, which is even and Schwartz, uh, is in the range of the radon transform. And uh, uh, so the reason why I, I, I bring this up is, as, is, is that uh, we want to do a similar thing in the context of uh, spherical radon transform. Okay, so let's get to spherical radon transform. So, you know, we can define several types of spherical radon transform, but the one that we are interested in is the following is that. So we consider the unit ball, which is in the gray, the gray area here. And we only consider functions which are supported strictly inside. So the functions are supported strictly inside. And we consider the spherical radon transform, which I'm going to define uh, next. But uh, the centers of the spheres are all on the, on this SN minus one, on the outer, you know, this particular circle or this particular sphere. So that's what I mentioned over here. So we also restrict ourselves to spheres with centers on S n minus one. So uh, typical spheres are as follows. And because of the support support condition, note that uh, we only need to consider T. So T here, so P is the point on the uh, on S n minus one. Um, you know, I apologize for the uh, inconsistency in notation. So as far as radon was concerned, P was the distance, but here P is the point on the unit sphere and t here is the distance and you can take t to be the you know you can also consider positive negative it doesn't matter but uh, we are going to consider for the case of uh, t positive right now but at some point we have to consider t negative i'll, I'll get to that so um, so what we have is so we have this p comma t where p is in s and minus one and then t is in r but but now if t gets passed two if t gets passed through, then this entire sphere encompasses this particular ball. And because of the support condition, uh, the spherical radon transform uh, is zero. So what is the spherical radon transform? The spherical radon transform is the integral of the function over this, uh, over such spheres. But we also want to consider the, uh, the mean value transform. So, uh, you know, it's just, which is what I define over here. So G of p comma t, where p is the point on the unit sphere and t is the distance 
is the mean value uh, over this plane, S n minus one. So f of p plus t theta d theta, which is so this is so if you have p and then let's say this is the distance t, then this is the integral of f along such spheres. Okay, now um, for what's going to come up later. Uh, I, I want to discuss a little bit on the inversion formulas. So there are several versions of inversion formulas in the literature I, for this particular uh, uh, spherical radon transform or the mean value transform. Uh, so one that I'm uh, that 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 will be of particular interest uh, in the context, especially in the context of unique continuation, is this particular formula. So this is due to Finch, Patch, and Rakesh, and this is specific to odd dimensions. And uh, um, okay, so this is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of operators over here. But uh, you know, you can you can think of this 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 last part over here as a back projection type operator. And what is of interest for us is the following: is that there is a Laplacian involved over here, or in other words, in the case of uh, odd dimensions, the, the Finch patch Rakesh inversion formula is uh, as a local inversion formula, and in the case of odd, in the case of even dimensions, they also have a uh, formula. In the case of even dimensions, uh, it's it's non-local. But we are only going to discuss odd dimension case. But I should mention here that this particular formula and actually a generalization of this uh, was also derived by Rubin in a very nice and uh, very nice article in Inverse Problems uh, using something using unique continuation. Um, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in this topic, uh, of course, this paper is very nice due to Finch, Patch, and Rakesh, but this is also quite nice. And uh, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, for the case of even dimensions, there is a there is an uh, inversion formula due to Finch, Pultmeier, and Rakesh, uh, who have obtained an inversion formula in all dimensions. And in this context, I should also mention uh, Kuni and Steve, who is here. So uh, his paper is, is a very nice paper. So he has a very elegant inversion formula in all dimensions uh, based on analyzing the Helmholtz equation. And uh, you know, in my opinion, this is also if you're interested in this topic, it's a must read. Okay, now uh, for instance, in the case of 3D, um, Kuniansky's inversion formula, uh, actually this, this, uh, you know, this can be written in terms of the capital D operator that I'm going to mention later, but if you if you look at uh, the expanded form is something like this is something like this so, but this is for the case of 3d uh, as you go to higher dimensions things become a little complicated but uh, nevertheless in the case of 3d this is what it is now one thing that i should mention is the following is that kuniansky follows a slightly different definition of spherical radon transform compared to the mean value transform, which was considered by many people, uh, for instance, Pinch, Patch, Rakesh, and also uh, Agronovsky, Kuchman, Quinto, uh, in the sense that, uh, so he considers G of PT, so there is this weight factor, this T to the N minus one, and he also doesn't consider this one over omega N. So it's not, it's strictly not a mean value operator, it's it's more of a, uh, a spherical radon transform. And, uh, but, from now on, uh, for the purposes of this talk, we are really going to focus on the odd dimension uh, spherical radon transform, not the even dimensions. So um, I have I have a bunch of uh, open problems at the very end, uh, but you know, I, I, at least for me, odd itself poses a lot of difficulties, and uh, uh, so we are nowhere near to understanding for the case of even dimensions for the kind of problems that we are looking at. Okay. So now, uh, now let me get to range characterization, which is the main topic of this talk. So the range characterization. Uh, so there are several versions of uh, the. Uh, there are several equivalent, uh, you know, characterizations in this very nice paper of Agronovsky, Kuchman, Quinto. Um, but the one that I'm going to talk about um, is is this particular range characterization. So. What it says is the following. So this is, by the way, this is specific to odd dimensions. If you're, so, but their paper actually covers both odd as well as even in one go. But the, but the characterizations are different depending on whether you're looking at odd or even. But for the case of odd dimensions, one of the characterizations, actually they have three equivalent conditions, but for the purposes of 
what what we are going to discuss we found this to be the most convenient to work with and which is what i'm going to talk about so what it says is the following so by the way this m is the mean value operator that i defined earlier which is 1 over omega n integral over the sphere of the sphere centered at p and t being the radius so what it says is the following is that um, a function g, which is in CC infinity of Sn minus 1 cross 0, 2, because 0, 2 is because of the support condition, right? So, as uh, if the radius gets passed 2, then the integral is anyway 0, um, can, is representable as uh, g is equal to mf for some f in CC infinity of p, if and only if this particular, uh, this is the, 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 the so called Henkel transform. So, if you consider the Henkel transform, uh, g hat of x, comma lambda. Which is which is given over here. This J here is the is a spherical Bessel function, which I'm which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, satisfies the following. So you expand this. So if you if you look at this as a as a function of x, x is on the unit sphere. So what you can do is you can expand this g hat in, in terms of spherical harmonics. So you look at the nth order harmonic term, which we which I call it as gm hat of actually, which they call it as gm hat of x lambda. And the criterion is the following is that this gm hat of x lambda vanishes at the non zero zeros of the Bessel function. Uh, this, okay, this j here is a spherical Bessel function, and this j and this j are very closely related. I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. So, so we are actually going to use this criterion for what, for what, uh, for what is uh, in, 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 you know, for what is required for our purposes. Oh, yeah, ah, okay, okay. So, so. G, G hat M is uh, expansion of G. Okay. In terms of spherical harmonics. And uh, by the way, uh, this is this paper of Agronovsky, Kushman, Quinto, especially if you're interested in this type of, uh, you know, especially in SRT, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very nicely written paper. And uh, I just want to mention that some related results in this context uh, uh, due to our Ambatsumi and Kuchman. So they actually proved this for two dimensions first, and then the, the work of Agronovsky, Kuchman, Quinto is, is covering all dimensions, uh, which came up later. And there is also uh, a range characterization result due to Finch and Rakesh, um, uh, which I believe appeared in inverse problems. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, just to just to uh, set the context uh, or you know to explain the notation, so this J alpha refers to the Bessel function of order alpha. For our purposes, uh, you know, I, I have the definition because we are only considering the odd dimension case, uh, and the spherical Bessel function is the uh, is the Bessel. So this J small J is a spherical Bessel function, which is some constant which only depends on uh, alpha of the of the Bessel function divided by lambda power alpha. And in the odd dimension case, the spherical Bessel functions, uh, okay, there are some constants over here, which we, which, which we need not worry about, uh, which are going to be given by uh, this particular formula. And this 1 by t, d by dt uh, is going to appear repeatedly in, in this talk. So just to have a simpler notation, so I'm going to. Sorry. There's alpha minus 1 in the whole sentence. Yeah. Alpha minus 0.5, alpha minus half. Not, it's not alpha minus one. It's not alpha. It's it's alpha minus one divided by. It's not alpha minus one. The whole divided by. Which one? The whole thing divided by two. No, no, no. Sorry. So it's alpha minus 0.5. Is this integer or is it integer? No. So because because I'm going to consider for the case of odd dimensions, this is always an integer. Okay. So it's an integer. It's in the yes. So okay, you can think of uh, you, you can think of this as if if, if I'm going to consider spherical radon transform in n dimensions, n is odd, then alpha minus half is going to appear as n minus three by two, n minus three the whole divided by two. Yes, n minus three by two because that turns out into an integer. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, right. Now, now comes the, 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 the topic that I want to discuss. So recall in the case of radon transform, so we have that any function 
which is independent of the angular variable and even with respect to p, the p variable, is in the range of the radon transform. Of course, you know we have smoothness condition, so we can assume Schwartz, you know Schwartz condition. You can also, you know, CC infinity functions are good enough for us. Um, so such functions are in the range of the radon transform. Now the the point that we ask is the following. So so we can ask a similar question in the context of SRP. So what functions g which are in CC infinity of zero to lie in the range of SRP, right? And so g being so uh, uh, I want to be a little specific over here. So g being CC infinity of zero to means that g is independent of the angular variable. And the question is what such functions lie in the range of SRP? Now a first guess would be that any such function is in the range of SRP. The answer is uh, no. And uh, uh, a second guess would be even functions, uh, if, but even with respect to what is a question. So that could be in the range of SRP. So that's also, okay, it is, it is partially true. Uh, it depends on dimension as we will see. Okay, so uh, before I do this, uh, uh, so notice that in our case, right? So uh, things are going to be um, at least trying to find what the necessary conditions are. Right, it's going to be uh, simple because we are going to start with radial functions, right? And in, in, you know, if you're going to consider radial functions, um, then you know uh, the one that screams right at your face is the uh, is a funk Hecke theorem. Actually, you don't need the funk Hecke theorem. You just need to do uh, you know a, a nice application of Fubini theorem by cutting by cutting the the sphere into slices. But okay, I just um, I just consider, uh, uh, you know, in the more general context, this funk Hecke theorem. So uh, basically, what it means is that the integral over s n minus one uh, boils down to a one-dimensional integral. That's what funk Hecke theorem, funk Hecke theorem does. But of course, it is the same uh, spherical harmonic, y l, whatever is that l degree, and. Uh, uh, there are some constants over here, and there is also a polynomial over here. But for what we consider, because we are, cons we are going to consider this for radial functions, uh, independent of the angular variable. So this particular, this Gegenbauer, this is going to be equal to one. We don't need to consider this as well. So it's just as simple as it gets. It's a one-dimensional integral. Okay, all right. Now let's try to find the necessary condition in three D, and all. So. Uh, it's rather easy to easy to easy to easy to do once once we know what we need to do, right? So so what I'm going to do is the following: is that I'm going to consider a radial function, and then I'm going to consider the spherical radon transform. Uh, okay, now because it's independent of p, I you know it doesn't matter where I take my p to be. P is the center uh, on the outer sphere, so it doesn't matter where I take. Uh, but what I get is the following. Uh, as an application of the funk Hecke theorem. So we get that, so G, this G here is the mean value transform. So G of S is going to be equal to some constant divided by S, this mod of one minus S to one of F of U times U du. And this mod of one minus S, okay, this, this, this is a very small calculation, uh, but this comes about because of the support conditions. And notice that S, S here is the radius. So S can be bigger than one or smaller than one. So if it's smaller than one, you get one minus S, but if it is bigger, uh, if, if, if S is bigger than one, okay, so this, this, this mod has to be, uh, you know, one minus S always is, 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 is going to be positive, uh, mod of one minus S. So it's going to be S minus if S is bigger than one. Okay, so then it's very easy to find what the, uh, what the, 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 the necessary condition is going to be. So the necessary condition is going to be that S times G of S. So notice that uh, one thing to emphasize here is the following, is that if you replace this S here, which is mod of one minus S, if you replace this S by two minus S, then notice that you get, so uh, G of two minus S is going to be one minus of two minus S. It's, so it's, it's still going to be one minus S. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So mod of one minus s, if s, if s lies between zero and one, let's say. So mod of one minus s is one minus s. And uh, two minus s, mod of one minus two minus s is also going to be one minus s. Correct? So therefore, 
the next so and then f you, so the integrand is the same in both cases so what you get is the following is that s times g of s is equal to 2 minus s times g of 2 minus s so that's the necessary condition that we have obtained or, or in other words and for what is going to come up later um, i'm going to consider this h of s to be equal to s times g of s in high dimensional analogs uh, my h of s is going to be s to the n minus 2 times g of s but n is in this case 3 so therefore it is uh, s times g of s so what we have is we have obtained a necessary condition so the necessary condition being that h of s is equal to h of 2 minus s or you know just re replace s by 1 minus s so we get that h of 1 minus s is equal to h of 1 plus s or in other words what we have is that the function h has to be even with respect to 1 right so this seems to be the necessary condition in fact this also turns out to be sufficient so uh, and it's a, it's a very simple exercise so let me actually tell you as to how um, uh, how we go about proving that this is also sufficient so uh, so recall so i'm going to use this uh, this theorem due to agronovsky kuchman and quinto sorry about this yeah yeah I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this criteria. And my n here is three. So therefore this is j, the spherical Bessel function of order half. And that's going to be equal to sine t by t. And uh, so what I need to do is to show that uh, if, I, if, I, if I assume that h of uh, t is equal to h of two minus t, where g and h are related by, uh, h is t times g, uh, then what I need to do is to show that uh, the, the, the zero harmonic term uh, vanishes at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel function or the spherical Bessel function. Now, notice that the other thing that I want to point out is that because we are only considering functions which are independent of x, right? the only the zero harmonic term is relevant to us. No other harmonic term is relevant to us. Right, so I only need to consider the zero harmonic term. Or in other words, this m here is zero. That's it. That's the only thing that I need to consider. So if I do that, now let's uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a very simple. Uh, so once once you figure out what needs to be done, then it's very easy. Okay. So what we have is this. So in three D, as I mentioned, the spherical Bessel function is sine t by t up to a constant. So the constant we we are not going to worry about. And what I need to do is to show that, so uh, as I told you, because it's, it's independent of X, only the zeroth harmonic term is present uh, in the, if you consider the spherical harmonics expansion. And what I need to do is to show that this particular function, G naught hat of lambda, vanishes at the non-zero zeros of sine lambda by lambda. That's the condition that I need to uh, prove. And uh, let us see how this goes about. And the condition being that h of t is the same as h of 2 minus t, where h and g are related by h of t is equal to t times g of t. So uh, all that I do is the following. So I absorb 1t into this. That becomes this h of t. I have the sine lambda. This lambda comes out. And then you have sine lambda t. And then you have this t disappears. So I have dt. And then the same thing over here. Now. Uh, okay, it becomes trivial at this point because all I need to do is to change this integral from instead of one to two, I just need to change it from zero to one. And if I do this, so notice that you have this h of two minus t sitting in over here, but that's exactly the condition that we have imposed. So the condition that we have imposed is that h of two minus t is the same as h of t. And if I, if I do this, then I can combine those two integrals and what I get is I get, okay, so this here is h of t. And then you have the sine lambda t plus sine lambda of 2 minus t. Now this becomes, uh, you know, like a pre-college exercise by right? using sine formulas. So we just use the sine formula. And what we get is uh, exactly the sine lambda comes up, pops up. And you have some, some function over here. And then you have the sine lambda by lambda. So what you get is you get this g naught hat of lambda is equal to sine lambda by lambda and then some function. Now, on the, the right hand side may have more zeros than 
uh, than the Bessel function, right? The spherical Bessel function, which is sine lambda by lambda. But nevertheless, because of this factor over here, notice that whenever this sine lambda by, so if I choose a lambda such that sine lambda by lambda is equal to zero, then G naught hat of lambda definitely is equal to zero. It may have more zeros. For instance, if we take G to be identically zero, it's, it's, it's going to be identically zero. But nevertheless, I have established that uh, the G naught hat of lambda vanishes at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel function sine lambda by lambda, the spherical Bessel function. So from this, we have that G naught hat of lambda vanishes. So therefore, one of the criteria, one of the equivalent criteria, and by the way, I just want to emphasize that this equivalent criteria is specific to odd dimensions. If you're going to consider even dimensions, then there is also a moment condition, uh, which is there in agronovsky kuchman quintos paper. Uh, so you also have to consider moment conditions, but in the case of odd dimensions, things simplify. So we don't need to consider the analog of the moment type conditions uh, that appears in the context of uh, radon transfer. Okay, so, uh, so at least in 3D, we have established that the, uh, uh, the, the characterization. So the characterization being that you just look at, so you start with a CC infinity function. You look at T times that particular function and that particular function, if it is even with respect to one, then that condition uh, is the necessary and sufficient condition for it to be in the range of spherical radon transform, right? Now, uh, what, what is of interest to us is to see if this condition is the condition that holds up in all higher dimensions or something else comes up, right? And we will see that this is not the condition uh, in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, you know, it depends on the dimensionality. So we will see, uh, so again, another warm-up exercise uh, is in 5D. So if I consider 5D, now what I need to do is I need to consider the, the analog of the funk k in the 5D case. But notice that uh, what, what actually comes up in the 5D case is this extra polynomial. So if you look at funk k, the factor of one minus t square is raised to n minus three by two. So if n is three, then there is no, this, this one minus t square factor is not present. If n is even, then this one mi n minus three by two is fractional. So therefore, you know, it's, that's a different beast altogether. But because n is odd, this one minus t square is always a polynomial, right? So now what we have, so now the obvious thing is to do a change of variable. So if I do a change of variable, so I get in the five dim in the five dimensional case, I get I, I get an expression of this form. Now notice that in the case of 3D, because this one minus t square was not present, this entire thing in this huge bracket, this term, this term did not appear. Right? So things 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 were a little simpler in the case of 3D. But you know, it's also not very difficult in the case of 5D. Uh, so let's define actually this four is not required. So let's let's uh, analogous to what we defined for the case of 3D, let's define H to be S to the N minus two times G. So N was three, so therefore it was T times G of T in the case of three dimensions. In the case of five dimensions, it's going to be S cubed times G of S, right? So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my characterization, not in terms of G, but in terms of H. So uh, let us see what that, what that condition is. So now if you do a little bit of uh, rearranging, then this particular, this particular term uh, turns, it up, turns out into something like this. Turns out into something like this. Notice that the same, you know, in the, in the previous case, we had this one minus S to one, but this polynomial part was not present. You just had this F of U times U in the case of 3D. But in the case of 5D, you get these extra terms. You get this extra term. And okay, so if you if you get an extra term like that, then the natural okay one thing that comes to mind is to differentiate, right? But notice that uh, I cannot differentiate it too many times because each time I differentiate, I also have to differentiate this bottom one minus s. But the nice thing here is the following: is that I can consider derivative up to order one, and it doesn't pick up. You know, uh, the integral doesn't disappear because. Notice that one minus s is a zero of this, this particular polynomial, right? Whenever I substitute one minus s, so I can differentiate it once and it won't pick up, it won't pick up the boundary terms. Only the integral terms will be present. So therefore, 
So we differentiate it once. And now it becomes an exercise in terms of, um, uh, okay, uh, Kramer's rule, right? Because you have, um, so you want to, so you, you want to consider HFS. You also want to consider H of two minus S because based on our uh, 3D warm-up exercise, what we observed is that there is some connection between S, the value at S and the value at two minus S. Now, because I also have to uh, uh, somehow, you know, get rid of, get rid of these terms over here. Um, I also have to look at H prime of S and H prime of two minus S. So now what we, the, the intuition tells us that there is going to be some connection between H of S, H of two minus S, H prime of S and H prime of two minus S. And that's exactly what we discovered. So the necessary condition that we, that we get is the following is that h of s plus one minus s by s h prime of s, this is equal to h of two minus s plus uh, the same thing, but uh, uh, what I want to emphasize is that s here is replaced by two minus s. So this is the necessary condition that we discovered uh, based on looking at, looking at this. Okay, um, now this may look intimidating at first, um, Okay, at least for me, uh, it was because I didn't know what to do. Um, uh, so, so, uh, but this has some very nice structure as, as we will see. So, uh, in terms of the D operator, the capital D operator, as I told you, it, 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 it is going to show up repeatedly in this, in this talk. So, if I replace this, so what I get is so this H prime of S by S, I can replace it as D H evaluated at S. And this particular part over here, I can replace the S by two minus S. So if I want to write this in terms of the capital D operator, then this condition here can be re rephrased as, as here. So you, you look at H plus one minus, the dot indicates I just, I evaluate this at either S or two minus S. Of this DH, this dot indicates either I evaluate it at S or two minus S. So what, I, so what we have is that there is some invariance of this particular function at S and two minus S. Notice for the case of 3D, this term here was not present. This term here was not present. So I just had evenness. H of S is equal to H of two minus S. But for the case of 5D, I also have a first, first order derivative of H. And so because of this one minus S over here, so one minus S when I replace S by two minus S, that becomes s minus one. So that's the that's the explanation for why the the uh, the s minus one and the one minus s changes. So this is the um, this is the necessary condition. And what we want to do is to show that this is also sufficient. Okay. And uh, in the case of five D as well, uh, the the fact that this becomes uh, that this is sufficient. So we are again going to follow agronovsky kuchman quinto um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the calculations become more complicated because you see that, um, uh, um, not only have to, I have to analyze this H, I also have to analyze the capital D. So in terms of the capital D, uh, the, 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 the derivative of H, but nevertheless, it can be done. So what we show is that the above condition is also sufficient and, uh, what is the uh, the Bessel function in this case? So the Bessel function in this case is going to be uh, so it's so, re so recall it's going to be um, n minus three by uh, so it's going to be n by two minus <laughs> n minus half, right? So n minus half. So n was oh sorry n minus uh, n minus two by two, so n minus two by two. So if I have n minus two by two, so what I get is I get j three by two, right? So remember that for alpha, I had an alpha minus half. So, so what I have is I have this j three by two over here. And what I need to do is I need to show, I, I, I look at this, so what we, so what is called as a Hangel transform. And because I'm only going to consider radial functions, I need to show that the zeroth harmonic, this g naught hat of lambda, so it vanishes at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel function, which is um, one by lambda, d by d lambda of sine lambda by lambda. And uh, 
based on based on what we saw in the context of uh, three dimensions you see that in, the, in that particular instance the sine lambda by lambda just popped out of the integral uh, just by looking just by insisting that h of t is equal to h of 2 minus t and uh, so let's see how how it actually proceeds in this particular case as well so in this particular case as well so i need to look at so the the, the Bessel function here is going to be 1 by t d by dt of sine lambda t by t so, so recall that if i have alpha then what I need to do is I need to look at 1 by t d by dt raised to alpha minus half. So alpha here was 3 by 2. So therefore, I'll, uh, 3 by 2 minus half is just 1. So I have this 1 by t d by dt, which is a capital D derivative, 1 derivative of sine lambda t by t. And then I need to show the following. I need to show that this g naught hat of lambda vanishes at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel function, 1 by lambda d by d lambda of sine lambda by lambda. That's the condition. That's the that, that's the criterion of agronovsky kuchman winter Now, um, as in the previous instance, so this g of t. So I'm I will also list the list the calculation here a little bit just to show you how it actually proceeds. Uh, and then uh, what we will do is we will give the the, the necessary condition in all dimensions uh, uh, as to what what we expect it, expect to be the necessary condition. Okay. So, uh, so recall that I have defined my h of t in this particular case to be t to the n minus 2 times g of t. So, uh, n was 5. So, therefore, 3, 3 of this t goes into this g. So, therefore, I have and then I have this t over here. And then I do an integration by parts. Note that in the integration by parts, no boundary terms are picked up because of the support restriction. So, h is 0 at 0 as well as 0 at 2. And uh, so, so, so what we need to do is we, we need to analyze this particular integral. Notice that the derivative appears over here. But what we have is a criterion involving not just the derivative, but also the derivative as well as uh, without that is up to the first derivative. Okay, so now uh, it, the, the path is clear. So what we do is again, you know, it's the same, the same old story. Uh, we split it up, change variables. So we get this. And for this particular function, this dh of 1 plus t over here, I'm going to use the, uh, the necessary condition. So the necessary condition is, the, is as follows. I have rephrased this in the language of, uh, uh, instead of t and 2 minus t, I have rephrased this in the language of 1 minus t and 1 plus t. So if I do that, this, this is the necessary condition. So the necessary condition is as follows. And I can replace this dh of 1 plus t in terms of h as well as this th of 1 minus t. And uh, then what we need to do is, uh, okay, uh, then, the only, okay, if you have an integral, uh, you know, the only one thing that we know what to do is to do integration by parts, right? And uh, so, so, we, so we do integration by parts and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost magical that when you do integration by parts and then you, you, you just combine certain terms, you get exactly this, exactly this, uh, an integral of the following form. Notice that the first integral has a cosine lambda minus sine lambda by lambda. That's exactly the, uh, the Bessel function, right? The spherical Bessel function, because if you consider one by lambda, so if you consider one by lambda, the chalk. So the Bessel function in the case of five, in the case of five dimensions, so it's going to be 1 by lambda d by d lambda of sine lambda by lambda. But, you know, I'm not interested in, uh, I'm, I'm only interested in the non-zero zeros. So we don't need to really consider this. So if I, if I differentiate this, this is exactly what I get. So I get this cosine lambda minus uh, cosine lambda times lambda minus sine lambda. So I just factor out the um, this exactly the same. So this term here, so I have this with multiplied by a certain function, and then you have some function over here. But notice that this entire term over here cancels because that's exactly the condition that I have imposed. That's exactly the condition that we have imposed. And uh, uh, so therefore, this particular 
this this is the, the 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 necessary condition and what we get here is that so whenever you choose the lambda such that this is equal to zero then obviously this g hat of lambda is equal so therefore we have also established that this condition over here is not just necessary but it's also sufficient in the case of 5 ds okay now uh, so enough of warm up exercises so let us see um, what what is going to be the case in general odd dimensions so the general odd dimensions the uh, so what we observed uh, you know over the course of these months is that it has very nice structure uh, but on the other hand uh, it's not that we, we we understand it completely right so for instance um, you know this is the necessary condition so if I consider any odd dimension, so odd dimension is of the form n is equal to 2k plus 3, then the condition on a function h, which is, as I told you, we are, also, we are, we are going to write the necessary condition in terms of s to the n minus 2 times g, where g here is the supposed uh, uh, function in the range uh, of the uh, spherical Riemann transform. Then the condition here is as follows, is that some uh, combinations involving the, uh, the the derivatives of h and this this particular part over here is this either one minus s or s minus one depending on depending on the parity right because if you evaluate two minus s then that becomes, that comes with a minus sign or a plus sign depending on what p p whether it, whether p is even or odd so the necessary and sub, so sorry so the necessary condition is the following is that uh, so we have the cp where cp are these very nice constants uh, combinatorial constants and what we get is that this particular combination at s and this particular combination at 2 minus s these have to be the same now if you consider so you see that as you consider higher and higher dimensions, the, the number of terms here expands, right? Because I have this n here is equal to 2k plus 3. Now, why k? The, the reason why k is because um, you see that when I apply funk k, so the, the, the polynomial that I get is 1 minus t square raised to n minus 3 by 2. So, and n minus 3 by 2 is precisely this k. Now, I can differentiate that, that many times the function. So given this function, because it is smooth, I can differentiate it as many times as I want. But the moment I cross k, then it starts picking up boundary terms because the polynomial term vanishes. Right? So therefore, the integral term itself disappears. So I can differentiate it up to k times. And always an integral, the, the, the only terms that are going to be present are the integral terms. So it might look computational at first, but uh, trust me, it's not. There is nice structure. And uh, uh, so what we get is this condition. So we have the CP and uh, 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 this proof here is, uh, is okay, it's, uh, you know, it, a lot of it was trial and error, you know, how, as to how to actually proceed. But then um, uh, it, is, it is a combinatorial proof, but nevertheless it can, you know, this is, this is what we establish that you have these constants over here and then evaluate it at s and evaluate it at 2 minus s, these, these two are going to be the same. Now, if I choose, for instance, if I choose k is equal to 0, then I precisely recover the condition that I, that I got earlier because then this p here is no derivative. If I choose k to be equal to 1, that's exactly the condition what, what I proved in the warm-up exercise 2 for the case of 5. And uh, uh, in the case of 11 dimensions, so this is just, uh, you know, just, to, just to give you what the condition is. So the coefficients are going to be this. And always you observe that these two coefficients are the same. And that, that, comes, up, that comes up from here. Now, um, honestly, you know, from my, from, from my viewpoint, I don't, I don't quite understand, uh, understand the relevance of these constants or whether there is a deeper uh, meaning involved as to you know the, uh, whether a deeper structure is involved as to why these constants appear. Uh, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is I also do not quite understand why this one minus f raised to powers appear in the characterization. 
but nevertheless this is this is this is what it is and now the whole point of the exercise is to prove that this condition is also sufficient okay and uh, uh, so this is where the you know uh, the, the the discussions with uh, Kushment and uh, Kunyansky and of course talk into this they, it really helped um, somehow uh, you know things uh, things were you know going nowhere and then you know all of a sudden discussions with them seem to things seem to fall into place so uh, so let us see so so based on the calculation uh, done in 3D and 5D. So we expect the, the above necessary conditions to be sufficient as well. And you know, in, in odd dimensions, I'm only considering odd dimensions. Uh, but uh, this is where I was stuck, or we were stuck for a very long time. Uh, that our approach was solely based on uh, integration by parts arguments. And it was not, you know, uh, very soon it becomes very computational, and then there is no there is no way to approach the problem. And uh, uh, so the first non-trivial case actually appears in the context of 7D. So in the case of seven dimensions, what you what you what you get is you get H, uh, you get dH, where capital D is one by T D by dt, and then you also get d square, that is one by T D by dt, the square. So these three terms appear. And as you can see, you know, integration by parts alone is not going to give you the answer. Okay, it may. Uh, but you see that you have two derivatives, but you also have to evaluate this at one plus t as well as one minus t. So keeping track of these, uh, evaluating it at different fun different points as well as the number of increasing number of derivatives. Uh, you know, each time you do an integration by part with all these polynomials, it's a it's a it's a it's a you know mine. You know, you make a mistake, then it just carries over. So I I do not know if IBP alone. Uh, would give an answer. We were not successful, but um, we do some properties of the Hankel transform. So specifically, uh, we use the fact that the Hankel transform, which I define it, uh, define it uh, uh, down below. Uh, actually, I, I already defined this. Uh, so this is an involution up to a constant. So there is, a, you know, it, you can make it to be an involution by adjusting the constants, but up to a constant, it's an involution. So the Hankel transform in the case of uh, 7D, uh, uh, but this can also be defined for any general or uh, any general even or odd dimensions. So the Henkel transform is defined here as follows. Now, what we get is that because it's an involution, so I can write this H or I can write this G just by just by multiplying this by this over here and then integrating with respect to lambda. So that's what we mean by an involution. That is, it is its own inverse up to a constant. So, for instance. What we have is that if I have this particular equality, from this equality, I get that this g of t over here is g hat of lambda, the same, the same Bessel function, lambda power six d lambda, very simple. But what is the advantage of the advantage over here? So the advantage over, oh, by the way, this is not something that we, uh, you know, it's not, you know, this is this this is very well known. For instance, this this is there in uh, Agronovsky Kushman Quinto's paper. They use it crucially. And several places, but uh, you know, for some reason, we did not make the connection. Uh, but the advantage here is, the, is as follows: so now I we can keep track of the derivatives of this g over here, and the derivatives of this g only translates to derivatives of these Bessel functions, and uh, we can keep track of that, and then use some use some properties involving derivatives of Bessel functions. So that's exactly what we do. Um, so, right. So. <clears throat> Um, so we want to prove sufficiency in general odd dimensions, um, and uh, so so as it you know as as uh, you know as of now you know uh, we believe this is the right approach, and uh, so we haven't we haven't worked out completely in all odd dimensional setup, but uh, the in, in our opinion the path is very clear as to what needs to be done, and what needs to be done uh, is as follows in our opinion is that you consider this g hat of lambda and then you multiply this by this particular function so this particular function is not uh, you know it's not something unrelated it is the bessel function of the second kind and what you have is that uh, the bessel function of the first kind and the bessel function of the second kind they do not have any common zeros so now what we what we find is that in the case of uh, in the case of seven dimensions 
if I if I look at this, uh, write this in terms of h of t, which is all, all I need to do is I just need to multiply this by t to the five. So and then and then I just do some algebraic manipulations, and then uh, I multiply it by the Bessel function of the second kind, and uh, magically what happens is that uh, Bessel function of the first kind pops up. So the Bessel function of the first kind pops out over here, multiplied by some function. Now, uh, this establishes our result. Why? Because what we need to do is to show that this g hat of lambda vanishes at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel function of the first kind. So the Bessel function of the first kind in the case of seven dimensions is exactly this. So it's going to be one by lambda, d by b lambda, the square of sine lambda by lambda. So this, this particular function, if we just expand it out, uh, because we are really interested in the non-zero zeros over here. So if I expand this part out, this is what comes out. This is what comes out. And what comes out on the other side is a Bessel function of the second kind. But this and this do not have any common zeros. So therefore, I multiplied by multiplied by some function over here. So now, uh, if you consider, let's say, in the case of higher odd dimensions, then uh, let's say for the case of nine, what we get is that this this is going to be this d cube. This is going to be substituted by the Bessel function of the second kind corresponding to the corresponding to the nine dimensional case, which would be the one with three. And what we get over here is going to be the Bessel function of the first kind with uh, with three over here. So the Bessel function, sorry, so the Bessel function of the second kind is one by lambda d by d lambda of cosine lambda for the case of seven. So this, if we just expand it up, this is exactly what we get over here. And this, when you expand it up, this is exactly what we get over here. So uh, it seems, it seems, uh, okay. Uh, magical at least to me that uh, you know something like something like this pops out uh, assuming the uh, oh, assuming the necessary condition so the necessary condition being some combination involving h dh and d square h are evaluated at s and 2 minus s turns out that we have this particular condition so now we have established the result in at, at least in the, in the case of 7d so in the case of 7d what we have is that because this and this do not have any common zeros, so whenever this vanishes, g hat of lambda vanishes. Yeah. Right. So this is for the case of 7D. And uh, 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 so we haven't written this up, but we expect the same strategy to work out, to work in the uh, in, in high all odd dimension cases as well. But uh, we were stuck for a very long time because, in our opinion, the the first of the first non-trivial case was uh, 70, 70 because the other the three D and the five three D was trivial, five D was you know simple integration by parts. But we needed to use some some finer structure to actually understand the problem. Okay, all right. So now, why do we do this? So uh, the reason why we do this. Oops. And almost so in, in a couple of minutes I just want to explain so uh, the unique continuation problem so so what we are interested in is the following so we ask the following partial data problem so suppose f vanishes on a non-empty open set and the line integral of f also vanishes along all lines or in this case spheres passing through you does it imply that f is identically zero so I have a picture over here but you can replace this lines by spheres right so we want to understand uh, an analogous problem, but for instead of lines, we want to understand this for the case of spheres. So this is this is relevant in the context of region of interest tomography. In the interest of time, uh, actually, it's just sentence. So so what you're interested in is you want to image a region of interest only using lines passing through that passing through that region. Now there are several prior results corresponding to UCP. Um, so there are several contributors. Uh, Rani Ramlao, uh, who is here, Kardurie, who was here, and uh, Suman Kumar Sahu, uh, my one of my former students, uh, uh, Divyansh, and then, uh, you know, there are several people, right? And probably there are several others. Um, now, what we, what we want to do is this. So, what we wanted to prove was the negative result in the context of 
uh, odd dimensions for the unique continuation property. That is, we want to show that uh, you can produce a non-zero function f such that f is zero in, an, in a small open subset inside. And the spherical gradient transform of f vanishes along all spheres passing through that particular open set. But f is not identically zero. And the candidate that we wanted to come up with uh, of producing this particular function f was by analyzing the, uh, the range characterization and the, the, the one that uh, you know screams at you when you first look at it is to look for the simplest thing, the simplest thing being radial functions. And that was the reason why we actually uh, wanted to study uh, radial functions in the first place. And what we proved is that uh, so the unique continuation property for spherical radon transform in odd dimensions uh, does not, uh, it's a negative result. That is, the UCP is not. Okay. Um, I'm out of time. So let me just mention uh, a few open problems. So the reason, okay, so one motivation as to why the way the, the, uh, the unique continuation property is not true is because of the inversion formula. So the inversion formula, as I told you, in the case of odd dimensions, this is local, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, uh, the, the candidate, uh, you know, you expect it to be, but you still need to produce a non-zero function. Non-zero function, which vanishes in an open set, but which, which is not identically zero. And the, the, the motivation for this was to look at a function f such that the range can be easily characterized. And that was the motivation for looking at radial functions. Actually, the original motivation for this came from Natro's book. And uh, Natro's book has a very nice example for region of interest tomography uh, by constructing for the case of radon transform. And uh, so then the natural analog is to look for the case of spherical radon transform. So the original motivation is actually hidden in, in Nandra's book. Okay. And um, right. so in the interest of time, let me just mention some open questions in this. So, so we have focused only on the case of odd dimensions. So now what about the characterization of range of consisting of functions which are independent of the angular variable in the even dimensions? So this is this this is completely open. Uh, at least to us, it's not very clear as to what we uh, as to as to what could be the criterion. I talked to Pushman about this. Uh, he expects some kind of non-local operator, uh, but you know uh, it's not it's not very clear. And once we have this, then uh, and we also expect a positive result for unique continuation principle for spherical radon transform in even dimensions. But uh, uh, we we do not know how to prove this. And the other, the other thing is, what about in the context of ellipsoidal radon transforms? Right? And also inversion formulas and range characterization for range of, by, by such I mean, ellipsoidal radon transforms. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for very interesting talk. Um, we will go into questions, but of course, uh, if you if you walk out because you've done something else that for them, uh, that's entirely understandable. Um, uh, questions, please. Am I slow? Yeah. So I'm intrigued that your frame condition is local <laughs> almost. I mean, it's it's local, but with this kind of symmetry. Yes, right. And uh, you mentioned even dimensions that you wouldn't expect to be local. But I'm just thinking that um, for over-determined problems, um, you know, John's equation for X-ray, uh, right. the X-ray transform in three dimensions is a is a differential condition, so local. Right. But in two D, the help is incomplete. So, so is there something more profound about that that, that you expect more or less local range conditions in uh, odd dimensions? Yeah, because the okay, at least in my mind, because we are uh, we are not looking at overdetermined problem. It's, it's a formally determined inverse problem. Yeah, right. Because we have restricted the the centers to be on the on the on the outer, you know, the, the boundary of the ball. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's it's just a right set of it's a formally determined inverse problem. So therefore, analogs of uh, uh, okay, I your question about range 
your question is about range characteristics. Yeah. yeah, so the thing is um, in the context of range characterization, right? Because, okay, at least in my mind, uh, see this one minus t squared raised to that power that comes up in when you apply funk decay. That's an that's an integer in the case of odd dimensions yeah. because then minus three by right. yeah. But in the yeah. case of even dimensions, it becomes fractional. Fractional relative. So, it's so be, therefore, so we expect some. Yeah. Yes, okay. that could be one motivation. Yeah. But you know, I don't understand it completely. Okay. Great. More I have a feeling that this, the role of this one bit and zero and two. Is related to the fact that actually it corresponds to the observation time half of the whole time. And it's clear that it is sufficient. Microlocally, it's clear that it is sufficient for a subtraction. So uh, I think that it's somehow could be related. Maybe one should go for the half time of the subtraction, which is the issue. So, so, so what you're saying is you only need to have like you don't need to go full radii. Yeah, because you, if it's patient, then you can reduce the other half, right? Yeah. Yes, right. So, so your condition might uh, only exist how to extend it to the other half. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. And it is kind of radar, right? I mean, I'm not sure about the weight, but mm. you, you know, like in, you're in 3D and you're doing monostatic radar flying around the target, right? Yeah, so it's it's a circle radar. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I mean, at travel time where the transmitting receiver is in the same place. Sure. On the sphere outside the region of interest. Yeah. Right. More or less. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. It's been a real, real honor.